comes to mind when you see these words? Spinster, career woman, crazy cat lady, hag, witch. All of these are terms used sometimes for childless women. Hello, my name is Jodie Day and I'm a childless woman. And I'd like to introduce you to my tribe, those one in five women without children, hidden in plain sight all around you. It's probably a larger number than you realised, isn't it? You see, because misrepresented in the media, in politics, in marketing, in social and healthcare policy, we don't really register on most people's radar unless you're either one of us or very close to one of us. Well, maybe you're thinking, gosh, with everything that's going on in the world today, this is pretty trivial stuff, really. <coughs> but I'd like to show you that it matters, because my tribe has a gift that we'd like to offer you that, if you had the courage to accept it, could play a crucial role in creating a kinder and more sustainable world. This tribe has always been amongst us, but what's different about it now are the numbers. One in five women, like me, born in the 1960s, turned 45 without having had children. That's double what it was for our mother's generation. It's up to one in four as what we consider the more family-oriented cultures like Ireland and Italy and even macho Australia. Up to one in three in Germany and Japan. And if my inbox is anything to go by, it'll be up to one in four in the UK for those. Now, whilst these numbers don't give us any qualitative information about why a woman might not have children, a 2010 meta-analysis by Dutch academic Professor Renske Kaiser would suggest that 10% of women who are childless are child-free, having chosen not to become mothers, and 10% are childless for medical reasons, including infertility. So that leaves a whopping 80% of women without children, childless by circumstance, with those circumstances varying widely, but often featuring the absence of a willing or suitable partner during our fertile years, or even an unsuitable partner. <laughs> the last time that childlessness stood at one in five or 20% was for those women born around 1900, and who remained childless for two main reasons. Firstly, because so many of them lost their current or future partners in the trenches. And secondly, because many couples couldn't afford to marry or have children because of the Great Depression. When you consider that it took the war with the greatest combat losses we've known and the greatest global depression we've ever seen so far to create these numbers before, can you begin to sense the magnitude of the social change that we're living through? But let's just take a step back a moment to the day that I joined this tribe. It was a gloomy February afternoon in the grotty studio flat I'd moved into after the stormy and distressing breakup of my last chance to have a baby relationship. I was standing by the window, watching the rain make dusty tracks down the glass, when the traffic in the street below seemed to go quiet, almost as if I'd put it on mute. And then it came to me. It's over. I'm never going to have a baby. I realised that my 15-year journey towards motherhood, including spending my entire 30s stuffing 50-pound notes into the hands of any alternative fertility guru who said they could help me and my then-husband conceive, were over. I realised that I could no longer think of myself as someone who was one day going to become a mother. I was childless. I was one of those childless women. This moment is forever tattooed on my heart because it marked the beginning into a profound pit of grief, a pit so deep I didn't know if I'd make it out again. It would have helped if I'd known it was grief or if the doctors and therapists I consulted about my life-wrecking distress had known, but they didn't. You see, my tribe exists in a huge cultural blind spot and many professionals miss it too. Grief is a language that this lost tribe speaks fluently, but which our society is deaf to. Now, perhaps you're thinking, well, it can't really be grief because you didn't actually lose anything. This is a very common assumption, and one that many of us share too, as we trudge through lost years, lost decades of our lives even. Because you see, childlessness is a form of disenfranchised grief, 
a grief that we're not allowed to experience, not allowed to talk about. Well, maybe you're thinking, oh, actually, this is all a bit melodramatic, Jodie, surely it's not that bad. Let me just share with you just a few of the things we've lost. That not only will we never have children, but we'll never create our own family. We'll never be able to correct the wrongs of our own childhood by doing things differently with our kids. We'll never watch them grow up, never hold their hot little hand in ours, never throw children's birthday parties, never take that first day at school photo. We'll never see them maybe grow up, graduate, get married and have their own kids. We'll never be grandmothers and never give the gift of grandchildren to our parents. We'll never stand shoulder to shoulder with our siblings and watch our children play together. We'll never be the mother of our partner's children and hold that precious place in their heart. We'll never be part of the community of mothers in a society and never be considered a real woman in a society that equates motherhood with womanhood. And as we grow old, we can't hope that someone will be there to support us with the emotional, practical challenges of ageing, let alone someone to leave our treasured possessions to, <coughs> someone to take our lifetime's into the next generation, someone to visit our grave. My loss may be invisible to you, but I stand here today astonished that I survived the initiation rite it took to join this tribe. And the reason I absolutely had to seek them out was because of bingo. Yeah, you see, because when we do try to talk to you, often what we hear back are bingos. And the reason we call them this is because on a really bad day, you can get a full house. Here are just a few of them, and what we're really thinking as you trot them out. Well, you can always just adopt. <laughs> Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> Actually, as a middle-aged, single, self-employed woman without savings or my own home, my chances were pretty zilch, actually. And even if I had been able to, today's adopted kids arrive from their rocky starts in life pretty traumatised, and about as far from little orphan Annie as you can imagine. And anyway, these are vulnerable human lives we're talking about, not some booby prize for childlessness. And anyway, there's the thing that becoming an adoptive parent was never my dream. I wanted to be a biological one, just like you did. Well, I guess if you'd really wanted children, you would have tried harder. Coming from someone who just got knocked up on honeymoon, this is beyond insensitive. <laughs> if you'd heard the heartbreaking stories I'd heard of multiple miscarriages, multiple failed IVF treatments costing more than six figures, of ethically refraining from getting, whoops, pregnant, of long-term singleness whilst waiting for a partner grown up enough to even consider parenthood with, of fertility robbed by illnesses, genetic inheritances, and family traumas, of failed surrogacies, failed adoptions, stillbirths, and countless other losses that could make you weep for years. There are many ways not to become a mother, and very few of them include not trying hard enough. But I read this article. OK. <laughs> Whatever miracle baby story you've read in the Daily Mail this week, <laughs> could I just suggest that the reason it's there is because it's news? IVF had a global failure rate of 77% in 2012. And most women and couples who go into fertility treats, including those in their 20s, come out without a baby. It's frontier science, and it's still evolving. But you're so lucky you don't have kids. You get to sleep in and travel. <laughs> so you'd trade your kids in for that, would you? Mm -hmm. The thing is, you may look at our lives and think that they're like your lives, but with more freedom and cleaner furniture. But what you can't see is our grief and an existential dark night of the soul that would make standing barefoot on Lego quite appealing. <laughs> and anyway, when I do go travelling, I have to say, it doesn't seem to be holding a lot of families back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, kids, more trouble than they're worth. Have one of mine. Fine. I'll be round on Wednesday to pick up the one with brown hair. <laughs> <laughs> Can you in 
imagine if you were to try to talk to someone about the death of your parents and they said this? Parents, more trouble than they're worth. You're lucky yours are dead. <laughs> exactly. What all of these bingos point to is a refusal to accept the reality of our situation and the pain that we're in. That the unspoken message that we hear is, will you please shut up about your childlessness and go away and fix it? Well, some things aren't fixable. And I think in our society, we're really uncomfortable with unfixable things. We prefer to believe that if you have enough data, make smart decisions, throw enough cash and a really positive attitude at it, anything can be solved. If you take a moment to think of all that has changed for women in my lifetime, the introduction of the pill, legalized and safe abortion, women's access to higher education, women's access to the professions and fertility treatments, all in one generation. I call us the shock absorber generation for the sexual revolution. This has completely changed the dating and mating landscape, yet our social mores have not yet caught up. The pressure on modern women to get all their ducks in a row and get an education, an income, a home, a stable partnership and a kid or two by the time they're in their late 30s is enormous. Yet there is no recognition of how hard this can be because of societal and structural issues. Whilst it is now expected that all women will work and support themselves, we have joined a professional workplace that grew up around the male pattern of fertility going to university in your teens, starting your career in your mid-twenties, working your ass off till your mid-thirties before settling down and having a family. But female fertility starts declining around 28 and falls off a cliff at 35, just at the point when men women and couples are just about stable enough economically to consider having a family. And that's if you have a partner to have children with. I think that perhaps there can be parallels between my tribe's desire to be recognised by society and that of the gay liberation movement of the last 50 years. Whilst we still have a long way to go in terms of recognising the wide range of human sexualities, there are now laws to protect the rights of LGBT individuals and no self-respecting HR department would neglect to include them in their diversity planning. Yet I don't know of a single organisation that considers the needs and issues of women without children in the workplace. And this is not about the numbers. About 10% of people identify as LGBT. Women without children are double that and rising. This invisibility shows up in the way that organisations routinely conflate female-friendly policies with family-friendly policies in the way that we are expected to uncomplainingly pick up the slack for our colleagues on maternity leave or with childcare issues. Yet, if we expect reciprocity, compensation or even recognition for this, or perhaps have the temerity to suggest that maybe we too deserve to spend Christmas with our loved ones, we are seen as unsisterly and difficult. In the way that political rhetoric rarely strays from addressing hard-working families, entirely ignoring the many who contribute their taxes to sustain our civil society for everyone's use. In the way that granny is used as a generic term for elderly women, and the way the government keeps banging on about how families need to do more to support our ageing population, entirely ignoring that by 2030 there will be 2 million people aged over 65 in the UK without adult children. It happens behind closed doors too when childless daughters are ignored in family discussions about wills and inheritances and you'd be surprised how often she's given the sofa to sleep and not expected to mind about it whilst her sister's kids get her bedroom. It even happens to future Prime Ministers too. Who can forget Andrea Leedson's gaffe that being a mother gave her a more tangible stake in the future than her childless rival, Theresa May? There are one and a half million women like me in our 40s and 50s in the UK without children, perhaps as many as 90% of us not by choice. The dark night of the soul that we've been through and the courage that it takes to hold our heads up high despite the shaming, othering and devaluing we experience privately and publicly on a daily basis 
has given us a gift we'd like to offer back to you. The gift of grief. Grief alchemically transforms the devastation of loss into an unsentimental ability to face reality, to accept life on its terms, not ours. Yet we are a grief-phobic society and often see grief as something awkward and self-indulgent to be got over as quickly as possible. But grief is the emotion that enables us to deal with devastating loss, with irrevocable change. The biggest change that we're collectively in denial about right now is that our planet is dying on our watch and with it our cherished beliefs that we can carry on with business as usual. Without feeling our very real grief for the earth and working through the fear, pain and sadness that are a natural part of coming to terms with loss, the consequences could be catastrophic. After all, every other civilization on this planet ends because of resource depletion. My hope is that by accepting this gift of grief, you will realize that perhaps the reason you have banished us from your awareness is because our loss reminds you of your ungrieved losses and that in touch with those, you will choose to be more tender with us, more tender with yourself and with everyone who grieves and that together we can begin to create a more emotionally robust society, one better equipped to face the very real challenges ahead, the challenges that everyone else's children except ours is going to inherit. <laughs>